Okay. All right. I think we are about to start the seminar slash webinar. Uh, this is, of course, as you all know, some of you know, and uh, I wanted to welcome the people on the webinar. We do this weekly and every week about uh, certain technology. It's basically our weekly technology update. And we do it seminar and webinar at the same time. So I wanted to welcome everybody here at GTC Corporate Office in San Diego, and I wanted to welcome everybody on the webinar. Today we have a special guests today from uh, Centec Global. They are our security practice partner. Um, going forward, we will use Centec Global for, to do security assessments for our customers. Um, and I'll let them introduce the team. The speaker will be... Cameron, from the, he's the CTO of Centec Global, just got back from DEF CON and Black Hat, and he'll tell you all about it. Next week, we will not have a seminar webinar because we are a sponsor of the AITP Cloud Conference, which will be at the Del, Del Mar Hilton. Our CTO will be one of the presenters to present about VDI best practices in the private, public cloud, hybrid cloud. So we hope to see you there. The week after, we are doing uh, an absence technology update on user, uh, user profile virtualization and other stuff. Um, so you'll be hearing all about our events every week. So again, welcome. And now I will turn it to Jesse from Center Global. Thanks, Keith. So think of me as the, uh, the flight attendant, and Cameron's the pilot. And Keith owns the, uh, the airline, so I want to walk you guys through the booklet real quick. Everybody should have a folder in front of them. Uh, if you open it up on the left insert is our enterprise offerings. That will go through all of our security offerings. And on the right side is a copy of the presentation Cameron's going to be giving today. At the bottom, you'll have my business card, my business card, and all the point of contact information. I uh, want to introduce the Centec employees in the room. Cameron's our CTO. I'm the business development and proposal lead. Scott Shefferman, uh, also goes by Shaggy, is our uh, security engineer and also one of our enterprise sales leads. And in the back right here walking around is Allison Burfield. She is our pricer. Um, so she knows how much it costs for me to stand here and talk to you guys. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been doing IT services business development for eight years. Graduated at San Diego State with a marketing degree and, uh, and joined Centec about a year and a half ago. Um, to really focus on uh, enterprise and DOD service work. Um, I'll introduce Cameron since once Cameron gets the mic, he's just going to break right into Black and DEF CON. Um, uh, Cameron's shorter than I am, not by much, but before I showed up at uh, Centec, he was the tallest guy. I noticed Ron's pretty tall back there too. And, uh, um, but uh, I actually kind of wished our CEO, Eric, was going to be here. He's, uh, he's about half as tall as both of us. For the, for the guys on the webinar, just giving, trying to give some visuals. Uh, Cameron uh, has been doing security uh, software development and systems engineering for about 20 years. Twelve of those were with SAC where he managed a billion dollar project, and that was in the uh, medical health world. Shake head, yeah. Uh, also done telecom work and DOD work, and then today he's doing our commercial offerings. He is our CTO. I do say that your biggest achievement is your wife, Carol. She's beautiful well, and good, <coughs> good for you. All right, thanks. Okay, over to me. Oh, and I forgot to talk about why we do a bike. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. I took the, I took the bike back. So uh, the genesis of us doing the Black Hat and DEF CON debrief is Centex has been sending five to ten engineers every year, and we go for two reasons. One is training, trying to get our employees the training they need, and the second one is also to learn about new vulnerabilities. Uh, this is the first year where we're actually opening this up and really trying to get the word out because uh, uh, budgets are tight and not everybody's going that should be going. So we're trying to go out and give these debriefs of the things that we have learned. So these are some of the high points. Uh, DEF CON and uh, Black Hat is over a week long. Uh, so obviously we're not going to cover every, everything today, but if you do have questions, you have my point of contact information, we can discuss things in detail. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to be going over... Uh, uh, a lot of, I've got like about 52 slides here. Um, can't tell if they can hear me. I'm going to be going over a lot of stuff uh, fairly quickly. I would like as much as possible for this to be interactive. So I'm going to be asking you questions. Uh, if there's, at any point in time, there's, there's, you know, technology in general, security especially, is really an alphabet soup of, of acronyms. So if there's any acronyms out there that you don't understand, 
if there's any questions that you have, any background that you're missing, please you know, just stop me and I'll answer it at that point. At the uh, end of the brief, uh, there will be a time also for just general questions, but I've got to roll kind of quickly because we're a little bit limited on time. So uh, as Jesse was saying, uh, every year we send um, you know, eight to ten uh, security engineers to Black Hat and DEF CON. These are, it's kind of billed as one of, if not the largest hacker conference in the world. Realistically, Black Hat has kind of now morphed into a security conference where you'll see guys dressed like this, you know, with corporate logos on their chest, kind of wandering around and, and learning as much as they can from each other and from uh, the hacker crowd. DEF CON is really a gigantic hacker party. It's days of just some of the most mind-blowing threats, vulnerabilities, and exploits you've ever seen. And every year that I go, it's just kind of a, a major wake-up call because uh, there's so much going on, every, and everything that you can imagine is hacked before it even comes out. So that uh, near-field communication stuff that you all have now on your phones where you can just touch phones, that was hacked before it was even available on most of the phones. Uh, the new air traffic control system that the FAA is going to be putting out, hacked before it even came out. So, I mean, and you, you sit there going through this stuff, and uh, it just really, you know, brings some of the fact that you, you really need to get the word out, tell people what's going on, hopefully get everyone involved, and at least get them some understanding of what they can do to try and protect themselves. So, a lot of times at Black Hat and DEF CON, uh, they may get up there and they may tell you about this gigantic hack that they just did, and, you know, thanks a lot, you know, you're all screwed, bye. And, and they'd bail out. So, what we've tried to do is also put in a few things in terms of, uh, what we call remediation and mitigation. This is what you can do to try and, you know, defend against these particular things that we've seen. Um, again, I'm going to be going a little bit fast. Uh, we will be blowing through some slides kind of quickly because some of them are just graphics. Uh, but please stop me if you've got any questions. Okay, this is our agenda. It's a little bit different from what was sent out. Uh, we've added uh, the first bullet, how global PKIs will soon fall. Um, we've also removed the last part, how cloud computing is changing, how we do things. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, a lot about, uh, like, the GTC cloud. So, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of great cloud solutions out there. And a lot of times at, at Black Hat and DEF CON, the things that you're finding out are uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities in other people's clouds. So we've dropped that for right now. We're going to concentrate uh, in, in this particular order. Um, let's see. Okay, so the first one, uh, how global PKIs will soon fall. How many people here do any kind of encrypting or, or signing of email or, or files? Okay, great. Um, how many people here buy things over the web? Right? Okay, so everybody pretty much does that. Well, that's actually a part of what's called the PKI. Okay? And a PKI is a public key infrastructure. And what that does is that's the support system that allows you to use those certificates and that allow you to use SSL to perform that kind of, those, those, uh, that kind of encryption, give you that uh, encrypted tunnel that your uh, credit card information is going over. Um, so what we're about to show here is that a lot of that is in extreme danger of potentially collapsing within the next few years. All right, so this is kind of a summary of a particular talk that was given by a group called ISEC Partners. Generally speaking, in, in a PKI, what you've got is, how many people here have heard of public keys? Like a public key, a certificate? Okay, so a certificate is kind of a cryptographic container for your public key. In the beginning, what you do is you create two keys, and one is that you hang on to that you don't tell anybody about, that's your private or your secret key, and the other one is your public key. You then send that out, and you have a certificate authority um, generate a certificate and sign it. And then that's the thing that you hand everybody. That's why it's called the public key. Okay? Now, there's a mathematical relationship between those two keys. And it's that mathematical relationship that we're having a little bit of an issue with. Now, underlying that relationship are what are called hard problems in math. Um, in general, the functions and mathematical transforms that are used are what are called one-way or trapdoor functions. They can only go in one direction, and it's computationally infeasible or nearly impossible to actually invert them or come back in the other direction. Now, the problem that we're running into uh, now is that that is no longer the case. So, in general, for a, a given crypto system, uh, some of the contributing factors that you have for the, the strength of the system overall is the uh, algorithm, the key size, and generally speaking, what, what we've seen in the past when these crypto systems started getting attacked and they started to show weaknesses, a lot of it was because the compute power that's out there was, was cranking up dramatically. 
So individual computers were getting really large. We had clustering, we had big farms, and now we have the cloud. So you can really focus a lot more attack strength at a particular crypto system. So in general, though, what we would do is against these brute force attacks, we would usually do things like increase the key size uh, or over a long period of time shift to another cryptographic algorithm. Um, so one, one of the big issues, though, is that back in the day, you were your crypto system was being attacked by a bunch of you know, bored teenagers. They didn't have anything better to do, and they had relatively small home systems. Now we're seeing these systems being attacked by well-funded nation states as well as well-funded criminal organizations. So not only do other larger, bigger you know, things are being thrown at it, but we've got a lot better funding and a lot better um, expertise. Within the last six months, as of July, which is when uh, Black Hat and this particular talk came out, there have been major advances made in actually solving the underlying math. So what makes this really strange is that before, a lot of the attacks that we saw were like brute force attacks. There were these different types of like side channel attacks where you were attacking some other aspect of the crypto system. Here, the actual math itself is being solved. So there's no real way around that. Once it's solved, you're done. And the, these are the, um, and you don't ne necessarily need to know what these algorithms do. What you do need to know is that these are the key algorithms that are underlying most of the PKIs that are out there. Um, so when it comes to SSL, for example, you may not be aware of this, but there is a relatively short PKI. Um, there's a number of uh, fairly large primary CAs and some sub-CAs. And they're the ones like VeriSign that sign a lot of the certs that the servers then get to form these SSL tunnels. So unfortunately, the vast majority of them are based on these now susceptible um, algorithms. And increasing this key size is not going to work for us anymore because the underlying math itself is being broken. So, and as we're going to see in a couple seconds, changing algorithms is problematic. We were able to do that in the past because the crypto systems were relatively small and we had control over the different pieces. Now, this is in the global era, I mean, how many people have browsers, right? Everybody's got a browser. You got one on your phone. Well, in order for you to change the algorithm, you have to change all the software. And you've got to do it all at the same time, otherwise everything breaks. That means you have to go through a global software change, and that's not going to be easy. So what they call the crypto ecosystem is non-agile. Okay? You can't go about just like changing one part of it. You've got to change it pretty much all at the same time so it all matches up. So here are the clients. Um, that can be the browser that you're doing SSL with, whatever the servers are the certificate authorities and any sub-CAs in your overall PKI structure. Um, the registration authorities aren't that big, but um, also your revocation servers and whatever services that you have that are used to revoke certs um, for various reasons. So these are some of the protocols that are now um, under attack. Uh, the handshake and negotiation protocols, exchanging keys, um, Pretty much a lot of the symmetric encryption is actually still OK. It's the asymmetric stuff that you saw before, DSA, RSA, that uh, are now uh, susceptible. So unfortunately, the overall effect is the global PKIs are no longer trustworthy. Digital signatures are now broken. So you can't really tell who it is that is signing something. Okay? So you're unable to trust the sender. SSL and TLS are also broken. Uh, because they are all based on, you know, these uh, classic uh, like RSA um, and Tiffany Hellman. So electronic commerce could theoretically grind to a halt because now you don't have that encrypted tunnel over which people are feel okay about sending their information. Um, you've got a lot of SSL TLS VPNs. Those are much cheaper um, and, and easier to set up. So they, they've been pretty much favored by a lot of vendors out there. Those are not going to be viable. And of course, you know, and these are just some of the things. Most of the uh, secure logins that you do right now, at least that portion of your website that you put in your credentials, that's protected by SSL. Well, that's, all, all that stuff is now going to be in the clear since SSL won't be working. Additionally, all the encrypted payloads that you have, whether it's uh, your own packet captures, somebody else capturing your traffic, um, any email attachments or files that you may have encrypted in the past, those can now be broken. As soon as those algorithms fall, all of that stuff can be broken. So everything that people have recorded, not that we know of agencies that have been recording anything, 
of ours, but all of that stuff is going to be broken. And one of the additional things is code signing and a lot of the software update mechanisms that we all use and we pr that we're pretty much based on, those all use the same kind of algorithms. So that's going to be broken too. That's the very thing that you would use to try and fix this problem. So it's kind of a, it's obviously a big issue. Unfortunately, what we're not seeing is very much talk about it. So the guys who were giving this presentation, really one of their first things was, we're just trying to get the word out because more and more people need to know about this. So there's a bigger push to try and fix it. So if you're familiar with DNS uh, and, and DNSSEC, that's also uh, broken. PGP, SMIME, and SSH, um, and uh, DAR, which is uh, data at rest encryption, can also be broken if you're using public key crypto. Okay, so the question is for the people in webinar land. Uh, can you repeat that again? Was there a publication of the exact weaknesses? Okay. Um, the group that was actually making this presentation were cryptographers themselves. They were not actually hackers. They were people who are concerned because they've seen that within you know the, the last year and especially the last six months, uh, they've seen at a math level, as opposed to like with uh, MD5, they were seeing a lot of hash collisions. Um, they're, they're seeing that, that uh, strictly at a math level that the, the math itself is being solved. Um, they're also coming up with very uh, accelerated ways of actually being able to circumvent or shortcut to get to an answer. So that, that was their overall concern. They did not. They they actually did go into um, some yes some some details down at the math level. I didn't want to. First off, I'm yeah I'm not a cryptographer myself, so I, I don't necessarily understand the math at that level. But um, we can actually get your name, and I can get you the information uh, from the talk. So apparently, at least according to the cryptographers, this was something that was gigantic and materially different from the weaknesses that they have found in the past. Um, the black hat in general is pretty much the place where everybody goes to get the big out, right? This is where they, they, they go to, to um, basically let the world know about a lot of the, the, the biggest hacks that they've been able to find. So these guys are standing up there in front of, you know, hundreds of, and maybe thousands, yeah, of, you know, some of the, the top hackers and, and some really well-respected cryptographers. And I uh, did not hear anyone saying anything about, yeah, this, you know, this sounds bogus. So. I took it at face value. <clears throat> so when asked what their best guess was in terms of how soon they might actually see these uh, algorithms completely fall, theirs was within two to five years. Now these are the guys, again, they're actually in the crypto industry. Um, now the, the interesting thing that they, that they did talk about is that's based on the rate that they've seen of the acceleration of these kind of shortcuts and, and solving of the underlying math. What they did say was, you know, there might be some guy in a white lab coat or whatever standing in front of a, a whiteboard who suddenly gets that aha moment, has a massive breakthrough, sits down, fires off an email to all of his, his crypto buddies. That then goes, you know, off to these mailing lists. And there's a number of frameworks that already exist to test any of the, the new vulnerabilities. Those things are changed. And within days, literally, you could see these algorithms fall. And then, of course, you know, a lack of trust uh, in the PKIs themselves. Okay, so assuming that these guys are right, and assuming that, that this is a, a huge issue, uh, the question comes of remediation and mitigation. 
Um, so the first thing was get the word out, let people know. Um, clearly, if, if this, this is not a big issue, there are quite a number of crypto groups out there. They'll be able to you know, defuse the situation if it isn't. Um, what is not susceptible to this are the ECC, or elliptic curve cryptography algorithms. So anyone here who, is, uh, who uses any of the NIST or NSA standards, um, so you know that Suite B, uh, back in 2005, was promulgated by the NSA. Um, in Suite B, all of the susceptible algorithms have been replaced by their EC components. So EC uh, DSA and uh, EC Diffie-Hellman. Yeah, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, yeah. So we're we're having a, a lot of discussion, so I can't re repeat the the entire discussion. Please go ahead. By the way, for everybody in, in uh, webinar land, I apologize. We've, we've had a lot of very good d discussion here, but I, I don't have the ability to uh, repeat everything that, that's being said. Um, OK, moving on. Uh, let's see. So given uh, what the discussion was, the remediation here is to ask your vendors to support ECC, to accelerate that curve. Because uh, some of the stuff, like NIST just two days ago released their um, draft TLS um, specification um, and also the draft DNSSEC. Now they are slowly beginning to allow for, e for EC, but it's not even being mandated within those as a best practice. It's just kind of like, you know, in the appendices, yeah, we might be supporting this. Um, TLS 1.2 um, is the first that actually allows for um, ECC algorithms within it. So uh, even though in the specs 1.0 actually could have done it, from what I'm being told, TLS 1.2 is the first, um, and not all the browsers currently support it. So you're right. I mean, they, they are slowly getting there. The question is, where are the curves going to intersect? Hopefully, they'll intersect later. So no, no big breakthroughs will occur until such time as we actually have really good EC support across the boards. Um, internally, if you're doing any kind of uh, development uh, move to EC uh, algorithms, um, use EC certs internally for your PKI, push for adoption. This last uh, bullet's kind of interesting. Uh, it appears back in the day Certicom um, owned a bunch of the patents for um, uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, those patents were later on bought by Research in Motion, which is now BlackBerry. So in order for uh, widespread EC adoption, it, we would need for BlackBerry to basically open up those patents. So the last thing you can potentially do is to lobby BlackBerry to, you know, be a good global citizen and just pretty much open up the patents. Yeah, I know. Or whoever buys BlackBerry. If I could reinforce your point here, I apologize. I'm a crypto guy for SAS, so I'm too deep in this stuff. But 
we should expect you're going to have a lot of transitions are going to be driven by Windows XP is going to be forced out of your enterprise because it doesn't support the latest technology. Over the next several years, you're going to have a lot of products that will be rendered obsolete because they don't support the latest technology. And, and this is going to be a major headache for IT folks because it's going to be driving obsolescence in very inconvenient places. So, so that I, I would just at the strategic level, you just you're going to have to be very attentive to crypto, and you're also going to have to be very attentive to where it's supported in your enterprise, because you're going to end up you're going to find very critical components that don't support secure crypto, and then you're going to have to either figure out how to get rid of that component or how to engineer around those limitations, and it's going to cause you a lot of headaches. So the gentleman from SEIC was just saying that uh, <clears throat> cryptographic support within products is going to uh, be a, a big driver in terms of technology refresh and, and when you have to begin um, on your own obsoleting a lot of stuff and, and getting it replaced. Um, in general, yeah, security is becoming much more of a, uh, a hot button and much more of a, of a driver. Uh, and I'm glad that people are starting to pay a lot more attention to it. OK, so we're moving on to the, the next topic, which is ways to avoid being hacked by your Android or via your Android. Uh, how many people here run Android as opposed to like iPhone or anything? OK, great. How many people here like Android? Awesome. OK, well, yeah, it's kind of here, kind of there. OK, um, how many of you allow Android usage within your enterprise? OK. Is it a BYOD situation or bring your own device? OK, interesting. All right, so rolling through this, this is kind of a, an amalgam of a, of a number of different talks that happened to both Black Hat and DEF CON. Um, in general, mobile devices are your weakest link. Okay, they, they can be attacked very easily. They can be stolen. You know, and these, are, these can be tablets. These can be uh, cell phones. Um, a lot of them either are, are not running uh, antivirus or software firewall uh, applications. Uh, they don't have other types of anti-malware support. Um, basically, the, the standard uh, raft of security uh, measures are not being done on phones, Android phones. Um, also, there's very little device uh, event reporting going on. So this was actually a slide put up by, one of, by the uh, CISO of the FBI. Um, basically, BYOD is a really, really ugly term. Okay? Nobody likes that because yeah, I was just at, uh, up in San Francisco at one of the, the conferences, um, and some of the top experts in the world at BYOD were there, and we pretty much you know, asked them the point blank the questions. Okay, you know, have you guys solved all the issues with BYOD? And the, the answer was no, they haven't. So it's still wide open, it's still very ugly, but it's happening, and so you're being kind of pushed into this. Um, so there is a lack of security both at the, the uh, individual device itself in terms of either not being protected or being protected by simple pins. Um, but the big issue is that you actually have full access through that device to all your corporate resources. So if you're logged in um, to any of your uh, corporate backend resources like email, chat, file sharing, uh, or any of your more specific uh, functionality, then really you're using the same information that can be used to hack in by some other means. So since this is on a device that can easily be stolen or subverted, that's generally a bad idea. So one of the additional points that came up is from our phones now, we're using a lot of cloud-based drive and file sharing systems. Um, unfortunately, that becomes a big problem because now if that device gets compromised, it's you now have access, or the hacker, or you know, the malware has access to a replication mechanism that goes straight through the security, the corporate security perimeter. So you now have given them, I mean, one of the biggest things that, that hackers have a problem with is trying to distribute that malware. Well, you now have that distribution mechanism. So once you punch through that device, you are automatically distributing it for them into your back end, into the, uh, you know, the corporate resources. Um, and additionally, of course, uh, all the logging and ownership mechanisms basically tell people that it was you who did it and that everything is fine. So if people are looking at these new files that showed up in the file share, they're going to go ahead and double click on them because it says that it was you. So in general, the best practices are watch your mobile devices like a hawk. I know that seems kind of like duh, duh but I see lots of people leaving their devices all around. 
um, leaving them unlocked. Um, use strong pins or preferably passwords. Uh, Android, you can get up to 16 characters. If you do, if you are in a BYOD situation, hopefully you're running some sort of MDM or mobile device management software that uh, allows for remote wipe, just in case your device does get stolen. Um, asset location, if maybe the, uh, the device was just mislaid and you need to, to try and find it. Um, mobile policy enforcement, so you can actually push your policies uh, from the corporation down. Um, data at rest encryption, um, and some sort of segmentation or encapsulation so that you've got like two different environments, one for the personal stuff and one for the corporate stuff. Now, how well all that, all that works and, and works together is kind of up in the air, which is why MDM is, uh, I'm sorry, which is why BYOD is still such a problem. One general thing though, never log in as an admin or using some sort of privileged account, okay, that has like some sort of domain privileges. You do that, you're just asking for trouble. Um, two, the next two are very interesting because people rarely do this. Whenever you're downloading an app from like the, the Google Play Store, um, you know, you get this long list of privileges and then you just kind of like, okay, okay, and you just go through it. You know, just like install that thing. You really need to look at those carefully because a lot of times that app is asking for, um, you know, privileges that it really shouldn't be needing. I mean, and a lot of these are very strange. And token requests, that's a whole different topic. I mean, that's you could take up at least half an hour just talking about the different tokens and what they actually allow you to do. Um, obviously, only uh, downloads uh, apps from trusted stores um, and from trusted vendors. Uh, right now, let's see, I think it was, um, oh, what's that? There's a, a video game, Grand Theft Auto 5, oh, yeah. right? Okay, that, that just got released. It hit the stores like, I think it was last Tuesday. Gigantic, right? Everybody loves it. And uh, of course, you know, Grand Theft Auto V for the, uh, for the Android was up on, on, the, on Google Play. It was a fake. It wasn't real. Tons of people downloaded it and, you know, they got compromised. Uh, at that point, they had only released, Rockstar had only released um, a, an iOS version. They had not yet released Android. So again, you know, you really got to watch and see who it is, the, the publisher is, do you trust them? Um, and of course, at that point, it was actually coming off of a trusted store, so that, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And monitor your Google audit trail internally, for example, if you're, uh, obviously you've got to be running uh, Google in the background, there actually is an audit trail that you can see what devices have been accessing your account um, and, and you know, where at what time, so definitely monitor that closely. Okay, any questions on any of that stuff? All right. Moving along to FBI's five best practices. Um, this is for combating insider threat. How many people here uh, know what insider threat is? Anybody, yes, no, okay. <laughs> now this is a little bit different from on the military side of the house, what, what we call uh, APT or advanced persistent threat. Um, it's kind of a subset. So insider threat really deals more with human beings, whereas APT can also be uh, malicious software, uh, or anything else um, that is on the inside of, of your corporation. Okay, this was from a uh, specific presentation by Patrick Reedy, the CISO for the FBI. He's the guy who gave us that, that earlier slide with the, the kittens being chased by whatever those things are. I have no clue what they are. Um, so inside a threat, somebody on the inside of your business who's stealing or releasing information. Um, now the interesting part is that person is authorized to actually access those things. That's what makes it so tough to actually catch them. Um, so they, they're also authorized to perform the actions that they're, that they're doing. So it's, it becomes very, very difficult. It's not like uh, you know, uh, alarms and bells will go off when they actually go and touch something. So one of the best practices here is to focus on deterrence, not necessarily the detection of a, uh, an improper action. So what you're trying to do is create a culture that, that um, basically deters these types of aberrant behavior, right? So if, if you've got everyone, and by that, I, he did not mean a kind of like a paranoia culture where everyone's watching each other to see, you know, is, is that guy on the inside? Yeah, I got my eyes on you. Um, instead, but just uh, creating a, a way of uh, kind of like a standardized business process and a standardized culture so that when people are behaving uh, strangely, it will actually stand out. Use positive social engineering, try not to get people into that paranoia mode, and really be thinking more along in terms of data-centric instead of system-centric security models. 
which is the, the classic style, right? Before it was like, this is my HR system, you know, this, this is my payroll system. Now you really need to think of, uh, you need to structure it around the data itself, especially now that the perimeter is being broken and a lot of information is actually out in the cloud. Know your people. Obviously, you need to be able to, to have personal interaction and, and an understanding of who your people are. It becomes much more difficult when you're in large, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations and your people are spread out all over the place. But if you can push this down through your organization so that your managers are aware of who your people are, that they can have um, interaction with them and, and kind of have a, an understanding of what's going on in their heads. There's a lot of HR data that you can use um, and typically HR in the past wasn't really involved that much from the security aspect of things, which is why correlating event data that you're seeing um, from any of the, the monitoring that you're doing with HR information becomes very key. Uh, because it may, may not look bad that some guy is cruising around looking at particular resources until you realize that that guy was warned and he knows that he might be fired. Then all of a sudden it casts a completely different light on some of the activities that he's engaged in. So having that kind of correlation can be very large. Um, go through initially and really have a, uh, uh, identify the information that, that you think is going to be not just valuable to you, but it's going to be uh, valuable to people outside of your organization. Know that data, honestly assess it. Um, the information that you need to consider is not just your information, but also, especially for like defense contractors, the information that you're holding that, be, that may belong to, other, belong to other people, your customers, your partners, whomever. Definitely monitor the ingress and egress points, especially the egress points. Um, but in general, knowing how the data flows back and forth is going to be very key. Um, clearly, your corporate security perimeter, now with the cloud deperimeterization, as they call it, uh, that's becoming a, a little more difficult um, with people working at home, especially now in kind of a, um, a funding restricted environment. We're seeing a lot of larger corporations pretty much you know, pushing people to go back to their houses and, and shutting down a lot of offices. That makes your security perimeter that much more difficult because now it's extended, especially if you're using VPNs, um, it's being extended into their, their home systems. Uh, obviously, as, as always, watch USB ports, printers, um, and your various distributed network boundaries. This is fairly standard. Baseline your normal activity, you've got to be able to monitor um, and perform you know, different types of surveillance across your organization. Baseline that activity so that you can look for those anomalies, kind of you know, doing a, a pattern matching. Um, give your employees the ability to help you catch insiders. This is a tough one because, again, you don't want to create a culture of paranoia. Um, and there, there were no real clear answers as to how you actually do this, but this, these are just some of the goals. Um, again, correlating that technical data with the HR information uh, gives you, uh, really, it casts new light on um, different activities that are being performed by your employees. Um, remember that insider threat is not just a technology or cyber uh, issue. Um, you need to really kind of look at it from a multidiscipline approach. Uh, what they were calling the whole threat approach, and also look at the whole person. Don't just think about them as some sort of you know, uh, cog in machine. Think about them from the, what they call the psych psychosocial angle. Uh, you know, if your managers or your coworkers are saying, hey, this guy is you know, acting a little bit unusual, you may want to step up some of the monitoring and do more of that uh, HR to uh, technical correlation. Don't make it impossible to be an insider, just harder than the next corporation. It's kind of an odd thing for an FBI guy to say, because it's kind of like the whole, you know, if you're out camping, you don't have to outrun the bear, just, you know, who are one of the other guys in your, in your group. Uh, but apparently, you know, that works. If you make it harder to be an insider, hopefully these people will move on to somebody else's corporation. It'll be their problem. Okay. Uh, really quickly, because I'm, I'm starting to run out of time, we're going to jump on to the, the continued rise of open source intelligence tools. Um, how many people here have ever played with any of the open source intelligence tools? Probably like Multigo or some of the others. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna lead you through some of this. Um, what, um, okay, so you know, we, the Snowden effect, right? 
So the, the Snowden effect has, has caused this really, really interesting uh, change and shift in people's behaviors because people are very much focused on the NSA, which is kind of interesting. Before that, they were very focused on industrial espionage. They were very focused on insider threat. Now they're kind of like really thinking about uh, the NSA. But what, they, what unfortunately that causes them to continue to miss is the fact that there's a ton of information that they're leaking outside of the, outside of the company. There's a ton of information that's already out there in, in the public eye. And for people who know how to retrieve that and who are skilled at being able to put that stuff together, that's very, very powerful. And these tools allow you and, and they allow you to stitch that information together and to really correlate it and make to uh, uh, basically make a lot more out of it. So let's see. Okay, so again, these, these tools allow you to, to really uh, rapidly gather that data from all over the place, and I'll show you some actual examples of it. Um, assemble it, uh, mine it for additional information and relationships that you, you never knew existed, and basically to, to synthesize it into higher level uh, information that can be used to attack you or your company. Um, so some of these tools have pre-existing modules that allow them to uh, access very rapidly public sources of information. That's what we're talking about here when we say open source intelligence. We're not talking about like open source software, where the software is open. We're just saying that the information that's being gathered by these tools is out in the public eye. So some of the uh, sources that this can come from are um, public you know, government uh, repositories, uh, commercial information sources, and just general uh, internet tools like uh, search engines. So. For the people out there who um, actually study this sort of thing, we found out the attack uh, percentages are moving up what they call the threat stack from the lower uh, technology layer into what I just dubbed the, the corporal layer. So before all of the attacks would occur at the technical level, you would attack somebody's network, you would attack their routers, you would attack their hosts. Now we're seeing attacks being done on people and on, on corporations. So as a logical entity, instead of just you know, their, their underlying technical infrastructure. So you can go basically from the network to information about the, the desktop, laptop, or mobile. You can figure out what the operating system is, figure out what applications are running on it, and from there, information about the person and the organization. So you're really going you know, end to end in different directions from low to high and from high to low. So again, from the technical up to the corporate and up and down. That allows you to get a, a ton of information, um, all again, publicly available, uh, you know, for fingerprinting that particular uh, organization in, in basically as kind of like preparation for an attack. So what we're also seeing is a lot of cross-boundary attacks where people are going from information from the person's personal life and then, you know, playing that over into the corporate and vice versa. Um, even as some, simple as something like you know, password guessing, right, which we've been using for years, you use information from the person's personal life and you use it to try and, and guess some of their credentials. Now that everybody's out there on Facebook and Twitter and everything, that becomes that much more easy. And these tools have modules designed to reach into these different um, social media sites and actually harvest that information and put it all together. So OSN tools can really be used by a lot of different people. It might be somebody simply looking for industry statistics. It might be uh, one of your competitors looking to get a leg up on you. Um, might be somebody evil looking to discredit or extort you, wanting your assets, wanting to you know, attack you, um, hold you down. Hackers looking for uh, entry points and general recon information. Um, one of the things that we found is that for most people who are, at, for most hackers who are attempting to actually attack your systems, they'll actually spend up to 80% of their time performing reconnaissance. And then after that, really it's just the, the last 20% of actual attacking. Because that's the hard part, is trying to look at the overall attack surface and figure out what's the way in. And how do I chain my different attacks together to be able to penetrate as far in as I can, to be able to scan around and, and uh, enumerate the different resources. And lastly, of course, this could be Enemies simply looking for ways to, to take you down. Okay, there's a number of different uh, OSN tools out there. I'm not going to go through uh, a lot of them because uh, we don't have any time. The one we're going to focus on here, and yeah, they, they're kind of kind of hilariously named. Um, so 
Well, the one that we're going to uh, focus on today is, is Maltigo. Um, Maltigo is uh, a really amazing tool that, uh, as, as I spoke about earlier, allows you to go out and mine data very quickly, bring it all back, and automatically stitch it all together. So here, we're looking, going to look at a low-level technical attack. What I want is if I'm going to attack Scott's systems. What I'm looking for is information necessary to allow me to perform that technical attack. I'm not just going to sit there and blindly you know, hit on things. It's going to take me too long. I'm starting out with a domain name. And what I need in order for this to happen is as much low-level IT infrastructure uh, mapping or profiling that I can. So I'm looking for breadth, depth, and count of all of his IT assets at the lower level and any technical details that I can glean from that. So what uh, the tool allows you to do is to go from the domain name, automatically punch into uh, the registrar information, grab all that stuff out, find then all of the domains registered to that same owner, go from the owner to personal information about the owner, then from the domains to the various DNS entries, which tells me their web servers, their email, the IP addresses. Normally, as you're running or if you're demoing the actual software, you can sit there and do it. Um, we don't have time for a demo on these. This is a static PowerPoint, so I'm just kind of leading you through how all of these things are chained together. And there are transforms built into the software, which you'll see graphically. You can actually see it. You right-click on it, and you say, okay, take me from this domain name. Give me the uh, information. And it, it pulls all that information back and links everything together. And then you say, show me all the domains registered to that same owner. So the next thing you'll see is a whole bunch of nodes that are pointing to that owner with all the uh, domain information in it. And you can continue changing, chaining that information together. So from the web servers, of course, now you've got the operating system, possibly, that the web server is working on, software and patch levels if they're running a CMS or, or other type of framework. Um, and you've got IP addresses from the DNS information, which you can then use a port scanner uh, to find out what you know, ports are open, what services are running on them. So this is a, the, um, this is a, uh, a relatively small, these, these diagrams can actually get very, very uh, involved. And they're, they're completely dynamic. You'll see them move around. Um, so you can see how very quickly you can build up an overall network map for the initial attack. So this, this allows you to drill down to those technical details and then you look at what you've got in your arsenal of attack weapons. You choose it appropriately, and you can go after them. So now let's look at a high-level personal organization style of attack. Ah, thank you. What we want is some sort of critical personal or corporate information. The only thing we've got to start out with is the domain registration information that we, that we got from that, that last run. We've got some website content, and we've got email addresses. What we really need are those unique IDs that I can possibly use to penetrate through and um, potentially impersonate people. Uh, personal attributes, which are also used, um, for example, security questions uh, and any kind of key corporate data. So what the uh, tool allows you to do is to go from those email addresses and scan for uh, search engine results and then brings them back and again links them all in. There are predefined modules that will allow you to scan and actually interact with Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Bebo, I mean all of the well-known um, social network um, applications. That then is all brought back and from there you can actually get into people's real lives, their jobs, what other social clubs, committees, gyms, and you might think well okay but that's, that's all in the physical world. Well all of them have a whole bunch of data online and th these, these tools will actually go out and bring them back in and now you've got all that information correlated. So you're beginning to build up this really, really rich uh, fingerprints of a person, the corporation, where they are in that corporation, and what it is potentially that they have the ability to do. The information, I'm sure that you're all probably on Facebook. I mean, you can link directly to spouses and friends and parents and very scary children. Um, there's photo and video content so you get to see, and of course, embedded in the photos, are uh, you know GPS coordinates, timestamps, so you know where the person was, you know when they were there, all that kind of stuff. And of course, this is a lot of fodder for you to be able to guess um, different types of um, uh, like passwords and usernames, etc. So this is uh, a little bit of a couple different views. Um, so you can see how it's chaining information. By the way, those are the two guys who actually uh, built 
uh, Maltigo, uh, Andrew Roloff. Um, and it links together the information coming out of Facebook, out of Twitter, um, off of their website. Um, it allows you then to, to go from the, a person to the, the different email addresses that it's found and to be able to link back and forth across different uh, Facebook accounts. And it all happens like that. In fact, the latest version that just came out, it will do it all automatically. They've kind of defined now these different levels. Before, you kind of had to know that chain, that kind of that attack chain that I talked about. Now they've they've kind of have them predefined. So you can do like a level one, level two, level three corporate footprint, personal footprint, and it just runs out there and grabs all this data. So in the end, you pretty much know everything there is to know about these people. And again, I mean, they've, they've the uh, it's 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 a very very rich tool. Um, you can see it, there's a lot of different visualization techniques that allow you to really get a good idea uh, and, and profile the overall person or the organization. And then, of course, you can always right-click and drill down and look for more uh, relationships and more data. Okay, so how do you go about preventing people from using this kind of information? Well, um, generally speaking, you're going to have to work with a security company you can attempt to do it on your own, and if you're in, in the position to have the knowledge to do it, you can institute your own data loss prevention plan. Um, in general, what you're going to want to do is, uh, like we talked about before, really monitor your ingress and uh, oops, that should be ingress and egress points. Um, look at the information that's that's going outside of your control, and that includes your sales and marketing outreach. Uh, you know, your marketing people might be putting information out there that you really don't want to share. I, it's, it's a good thing to get the information out there, but you really need to uh, you know, keep it under close watch. Uh, there's a lot of other information, some of which you, you can uh, or can't control, including SEC filings. Um, there is a lot of documentation that's already out there. We talked about the domain registries, but a lot of it also appears on par partner portals, um, utilities, uh, different you know, public um, sources of information, including letters of incorporation. Um, there's not much that you can do about that. But definitely install some DLP software at your egress points to monitor what's going out, potentially blocking things, especially like at your corporate email boundary. Um, as we've talked about before, establish those patterns. Uh, figure out what's normal behavior, what normally should be leaving uh, your company, and what should not in terms of you know, the timing and the flow rate. And again, work with uh, a security company to find out you know, what information is already leaked out there there are uh, a number of security programs that you can run that will go out there to things including uh, all the search engines and you may not even have been aware of it but the search engines have already indexed a lot of your key internal information um, so those those tools will actually go out there and will scan through Bing and scan through Google and all the the other um, big data stores and bring that information back to you once you get that information try and analyze how it got out there Clearly something's wrong, you've got some ports open, you've got a service that's running out there, you need to shut it down. Work with those information providers, Google or Bing, have them take that data down, uh, maybe for your domain registrar, have, uh, there are privacy settings you can pay a little more money for to, to have that stuff uh, uh, covered or, or hidden. And then feed back the lessons that you've learned from doing this back to your DLP plan so that uh, going forward <clears throat> you won't continue to leak that information. Okay, I am now down to about three minutes. I think at this point, uh, probably going to have to break. Um, any questions about any of the material that was covered? Any questions out there in uh, webinar land? Yes. Have we done any analysis how the uh, Citrix uh, product and the uh, NetScaler impact uh, the physical environment? No, we, we in particular have not. Um, do you have anything from GTC? Um, no, just uh, we have a few tools that we've been using to do uh, vulnerability testing for third party partners and tools. So that's what we can figure and we'll also want to validate them. But I would think that like a net scaler, uh, a lot of these threats and attacks will prevent some of these threats and attacks by planning and address those things like this. Yeah, because what, who why are you saying yes? Who's saying yes? Well, because. Uh, it's a long story of a DOD NetScaler <laughs> implementation. Yeah. We did a DOD NetScaler implementation. Yeah. We'll tell you the story that's long and involved. 
Okay, we had, we, had, <laughs> we had a question about NetScaler, but I, I don't think that uh, we uh, we don't have an answer, and I don't think that there uh, is one yet. Okay, uh, any other questions? All right. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much for uh, for attending this session. And if you uh, have any questions, um, I, I've got some cards here. Jesse is available. Scott and uh, you know we'd be ha more than happy to. Uh, drill down further into any information that you need um, or answer any questions. All right, thank you. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye. <laughs>